Now gather round people and hearken to me As I tell you a tale of a boy on the sea And a huge Bengal tiger in a tiny lifeboat And the tiger was scary cause it once ate a goat And thus, welcome to Life of Pi one of my all-time favorite books, lovely, original, and the most popular also uh, among the schools in the Free State as the go-to novel to study. As you can see from the screen, we're looking at first the plot. Now, just some background here. Um, when I was uh, teaching this, a couple of years back, I noticed that often the youngsters at school don't read the whole book and that becomes an issue. So, what I'm going to do before we do anything else like the themes and the characters and stuff, I want to cover the essential elements of the plot. I regard that as vital. As you can see also, I'd like to give a Special thank you to Christan, Chrysanthi Halakatava Stevens, who is uh, one of the teachers at Hartje S. Louis Buerta. She very kindly allowed me to use some of the material that she developed. And the resources you can see are listed on the screen. So, let's look first at the plot. Here we are, this is the plot in a nutshell. And there, because I'm sure that everybody watching this has eyes and knows how to read, I won't need to tell you what the writing says. Aren't I clever? However, you'll also see this picture taken from the movie of a whale passing underneath the lifeboat and you can see the, the raft behind the boat as well. And there we are, now that we've looked in the plot, uh, Sorry, I must just ask the production crew, what do you want me to do for the next five hours we've finished? Oh dear. Well, we'll make another plan. Let me then um, point out that I am, uh, on my wife's advice, wearing a blue shirt. Now, why blue? It's very simple. We are making this recording, or presenting this broadcast, in Bloemfontein, which is in Africa, and of course... It's relevant to Pi because Bloemfontein is one of the homes of the meerkat. On the farms all around us, we have lots and lots of meerkats, or if you want to stick to the original Afrikaans, meerkatta, which is the correct plural. But having said that, Africa, blue shirt. So we can call this shirt African Pi Blue. No, I don't feel guilty and I'm not going to apologize. <laughs> I love a good pun. Okay, now that we've seen it briefly, let's go on to it in a little bit more detail. Um, it might be helpful there. Wherever possible, by the way, I have included pretty pictures. Um, it does make life a bit easier to be able to see as well as merely read. So there we are. One or two pictures. Uh, that's... Um, Piscine Molitor Patel from very young to not so young and then to vintage. When I say vintage, not even as old as I am now, so um, <laughs> maybe I'm being a bit cheeky. But let's start, obviously, with part one. Now, as we all know, uh, the book has an introduction, which is called The Author's Note. And that sets the background. Now, I'm not going to look at that yet, because really it's, it's interesting, but it's not vital. So what we're going to do is focus first on Pi and his background. Let's take a look at this. Okay, setting. Always important, your setting is where and when. And this particular book... Um, jumps all over the place, but the, the principal, the two principal towns are Toronto and Pondicherry, as you can see there. However, <laughs> the main setting is on a lifeboat 
in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Well, all over the Pacific Ocean, to be quite honest, because he drifts a massive distance over the period of 227 days. And I am deadly certain that that 227 is not a coincidence. Um, let me just see. I see here's a, a paper, piece of paper, and a marker pen. I may be able to play a quick trick here. Now, let's see if I could still remember how to press buttons on this incredible device. And have I got stable paper? Yes, there we go. Right. Uh, two to seven. You can all see that? Good. Let's change it slightly. And it will become 22 over seven. Can you all see that? Equals 3.14 equals pi. Isn't that funny? I really... <laughs> That's one of the reasons why I enjoy this book to this extent, is that the author, Jan Martel, has a magnificent sense of humor. And he's continually chucking in these little snippets just to make the book a little bit more entertaining every time. So it's very entertaining as far as I'm concerned. Okay, let's see what else we've got here. Um, talks about first person. Now, just for the record, there are three different types of narration. You've got first person, second person, and third person. First person and past tense is, of course, the standard narration technique um, because it produces a first-hand account of a story which happened. And the, the person to whom it happened is now recounting the fact to you. In this case, of course, we have... Um, Pi, or which is short for Piscine, Molitor Patel, who is the principal narrator in all the book, to be quite honest. Right. Third person is the other famous type of narration. It's the you know the all-seeing narrator because your principal form of the uh, person is he, she, it, them, they. All right. That's a most useful form of narration because uh, you can see into the mind of the characters without the character actually telling you what they're feeling. You can be told by somebody else. Useful. And quite honestly, the most, uh, that's one of the most skilled forms of writing, uh, although most authors uh, have developed the technique. But here, oh, sorry. Before we go on, there is the third one, which is written in the second person. I have only twice encountered the second person is you. Singular, plural, subject or object, it remains you. Twice I've read competent pieces of writing set in the second, piece, second person. It was the most amazing experience. It requires talent in writing technique that I don't have and that very few other people have either. But the people who are able to use that technique, wow, it's incredible. <coughs> so, that's just for the record. Here, we have this, which is first person, right? Let's move on slightly. Okay, now the next chunk or section I want to look at very briefly, um, pi. Uh, is narrating as an adult looking back. So if you're interested in your types of essays, um, this is basically a reflective essay, if you want to give it a definition. There's many other styles and genres and everything all intertwined with this. But the technical definition, I think, reflective essay. Because the element of, the main element of a reflective essay is looking back over um, a great uh, um, change in your life and considering the before and after aspects. All right? Lessons learned, all that sort of thing. And believe me, this story fits that bill 
perfectly. So there we are, an extra mahala for you um, to improve your essay writing technique. Um, that is the definition of reflective essay. Okay, so we switch all the way from young childhood. I'm not too sure of the exact age, but I know that the um, age at which Pi begins his uh, time on board the lifeboat is 16. And then, of course, um, obviously he'll have had lots and lots of time before that as his father's running the zoo. And, um, well, Pondicherry. Okay. Pi also is talking about his sufferings in life. And the two essential elements of his experience here, obviously, it's his intensely strong faith. He is one of the most powerful believers I've ever seen, and his incredible knowledge of zoology. I mean, one of the reasons why I enjoy this book so much, I myself am interested in zoology. I tend to specialize more in herpetology than everything else, but the rest fascinates me. And I absolutely love the place where we're staying because it's surrounded by wildlife and, um, um, all sorts of things such as, uh, it's not only the big stuff that interests me. I mean, I love to look at the small stuff. Um, scorpions in particular, fascinating. Okay, yes, it is relevant because they are in the book. It talks about the meerkatter mainly eating scorpions. Um, and they are immune to the venom. <laughs> I especially love that part of this book. Um, but other things like uh, mantids. The place where we're staying is absolutely swarming with praying um, mantes, I think is the correct plural, the, the praying mantis, and so many types of them and unusual colors and shapes. Absolutely fascinating, and they're great friends of mine because they eat things that I don't want bothering me, such as flies and mosquitoes and all sorts of swarming chochas. I love spiders as well. I mean, <laughs> I don't go and get a ton of doom or something when there's a spider in the room, I say, wow, great, thank you. Once again, you're going to catch spiders and flies for me. And in this way, I share quite a lot with Pi in his attitude to life. And for the record, that's a fact. We have no poisons in our house. I don't like the idea of poisons. They're always bad for you, even if the tin says they're not. And um, they wipe out all our friends as well, such as the spiders and the mantids. So rather, let nature take its course. Mosquitoes, come into my house, you're in trouble. <laughs> okay, then, this um, intense suffering, of course, you'll uh, come across in the book if you haven't already done so. Let's move on slightly. Now, we are introduced to... Francis um, Adirubasami. Now, incidentally, um, it's interesting to note that many Indian names are very complex indeed. I assume they each have uh, meanings of their own, but you notice this one is uh, six syllables in total. So please remember that. Um, just while we're talking about this, one of the things, obviously, that you guys want to do well in is your final exams. And, you know, examiners have got this sneaky habit of asking you questions which rely on knowledge as well. So make sure that you can, for example, correctly spell the name Adurubasami. Because <laughs> it may or may not be required of you in a final exam. And if you can correctly spell it, well, great. It's going to make life easier for you. But this is an important detail in the book. Pai is an excellent swimmer, thanks to Mr. Adirubasami, all right? And that is a critical component of the fact that he's able to survive on the lifeboat, all right? The three elements, um, the three most critical elements, ignoring his personality, etc., knowledge of zoology and animals, um, knowledge of swimming, or skill in swimming, I should rather say. And, of course, deep, strong faith in God, which keeps him going the whole time, even when logic tells him it's time to die. 
Right. And of course, uh, it talks here also about the unusual name of Pi, um, short for Piscine Molitor, obviously. Um, but it's that named after that beautiful, beautiful swimming pool in Paris, in France. Oh, here. Sorry, I forgot. I put that in. Uh, the Piscine Molitor, um, it's a swimming club. And of course, Francis um, Adirubasami is himself a swimming champion. I've put, I did mention swimming champion. Let me just make sure. Okay. Here we are. Right, let's just carry on for a second here. Now, we're into the Pondicherry Zoo. And this was, of course, um, where Pai spent most of his pre-Pacific life growing up. Now, growing up in a zoo is great fun because it's part of this enormous um, complex of scenery and animals and everything, but it can be dangerous. I have seen in the Bloemfontein Zoo many years ago certain silly people doing very certain silly things. Um, one of my favorite animals there was the rhinoceros. I mean, you could walk right up to it. The dividing wall between people and the rhinos was not even four feet high. But it was perfectly good because the rhinos couldn't cross over it. But I often saw people reaching across to scratch the rhinos on the back, which was, I thought, well, <laughs> probably harmless, <laughs> but why take a chance? So that's one thing that I never did. But um, other things, you know, drunk people um, climbing into uh, lion dens and getting eaten in the process. Uh, yeah. Especially in South Africa, it looks as, and the Free State. Oh boy, the Free State is very fond of a drink or two, and it's usually while people are being drunk that they get silly, especially among dangerous animals, and it's a very bad idea. But having said that, you've got this comment here uh, that um, Pai's father was very concerned that his two young sons should not take any chances with the animals and of course um, he takes them all one day and we'll look at this later we'll read the passages but he takes them off and he takes them to the tiger enclosure and they bring in a goat and they quite literally feed this goat to the tigers and you know the tigers <laughs> crunch up the goat very easily indeed which is not too surprising I mean, a, um, a true Bengal tiger is about nine feet long. It's over three meters. And if you've never been close to one, the sheer size is shocking. They are bigger than some in length. They are bigger than some breeds of horses. Well, quite a few breeds of horses if you look at your ponies. So, you know, <laughs> here goes. <laughs> Goat to, to two tigers. There can only be one outcome to that. All right, and of course it has this shocking effect that Pi now knows that um, you know, um, wild animals can be very dangerous indeed. People, before I get you bored, we're going to take a short break. Um, just a reminder, we are looking today at the life of Pi, and this is the first part of our series of lessons, and I hope to see you again in a minute or two when we carry on with the plot. Goodbye for now. Welcome back. Today we are looking at The Life of Pi, this absolutely fabulous novel by Jan Martel. And we are currently looking at the plot. I've left on the screen for you the previous section that we did. Now, we carry on to the next important um, event in Pi's life. Oh, here's a couple of pretty pictures for you. Um, there's the, uh, the Piscine Molitor, the swimming pool as it is today. Still there, upgraded, but still there nevertheless. There's part of um, 
the Pondicherry Zoo. And of course, there is the African sunrise or sunset, depending on your perspective, behind a lion. And one of the descriptions that Pai gives in the novel is the sensation of waking up to a lion's roar. And wow, it's something that I love as well. We were um, visiting in um, a campsite right next to the Kruger um, a few years ago, 10 years back now, and these lions, the Kruger was literally just across the fence from where we were staying, and these lions made a kill. They took down a large buffalo, and they were eating this thing for about two days. And the roars of the lions at night were absolutely thrilling. The ground shakes underneath when they roar. I really loved that, and so did Pi. And you see, that's another thing I have in common with him. Right, let's move on here. Now, here we come to the whole issue of religion. Now, I'm going to be very careful here. I want to bring to your attention an important fact about myself, and bear with me, this is relevant. I am a rotten person when it comes to studying theology or, you know, the practice of religions, because I'm biased. I myself am a practicing Christian. Therefore, I will automatically regard other faiths with, um, shall we say, doubt, because I don't think the same way that other people do. But having said that, of course, I have tremendous respect for other people's faith for the simple reason it's subjective. The worst thing that you can do is to force somebody to agree with you, because then it's very artificial. So um, I have friends in um, all the main religions on the screen there, and many others as well, including Incidentally, one friend who was my closest friend for many years, and he was an absolute atheist, <laughs> but he was honest about it. And to many people, just by the way, communism is a, uh, a religion. I mean, I remember uh, Joe Slovo uh, when he came back from exile and stuff, and he said quite bluntly, he's a communist, a communist he will die, and he died. And when he died, he was proudly communist. He stuck to his belief towards the end. And I respected him for that at the same time that I disagreed with him for that. <laughs> but be that as it may, here we have this most unusual situation. Pai, of course, is brought up as a Hindu, which is the most common uh, religion of India. And he then encounters um, the two or two of the three great monotheistic faiths. There, I'm, I'm using a little bit of technical jargon there. Monotheistic means to believe in one God. Um, the three monotheistic faiths, faiths are, of course, Christianity, Islam, and the original Judaism. All right? Now, and um, yes, I am um, a staunch believer that uh, the Bible is uh, correct. And the first part of the Bible, the biggest part of the Bible, is the, the Bible of the Jews or the Israelites. I suppose you'd have to be technically accurate. And um, uh, I believe every word in that part is correct as well. <laughs> but I mustn't <laughs> preach too much here. <laughs> okay, here you have this unusual uh, instance where Pi encounters these two other religions and loves them. He finds that deep meaning in both them and um, Hinduism. And so he's probably the only person in history who has no problem about combining all three and having firm belief in all three. That's uh, um, somebody who's obviously got a, a very positive outlook on life. That he doesn't say, no, that's bad, that's bad, I can only do this, but this, but he says, they've all got good bits. I'll take, I'll take the whole lot. Thank you. <laughs> right. And here we move on to the final bit of uh, part one of the story. It's the decision. This really very important decision the father makes 
We're going to move, he says. And that's what they do. They've made the decision and then they start to sell off some of the animals and many of the other animals they're going to uh, keep and take with them. Um, the reason for this, of course, it's very specific here, is the political instability that was in India at the time. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, Gandhi, Mrs. Gandhi, uh, Indira, I think her first name was Indira Gandhi, um, lost the election uh, but was caught out that she had committed election fraud. And so, in order to maintain her power, she simply declared a state of emergency and the country was ruled by decree for about two years, from 77 until 79, if my memory is correct. And many people did not like this. Well, nobody uh, likes being put under a state of emergency because that basically means they suspend the constitution and everything like that. And, well, it's distasteful. So, of course, the father says, that's it, we're going somewhere else. And where do they choose to go? Canada. Now, just for interest, um, Canada, I was recently watching a, um, a short article on YouTube, I think it was, talking about the countries in the world which are most friendly to immigrants. And Canada just happens to be one of them. They are very willing to accept people from other countries. Obviously, you know, the people have to be respectable and educated and everything like that. But um, as a general rule, Canada is very friendly. And I don't know if it's because of that or in spite of that or just coincidentally, they've chosen Canada as their destination. And I must say, it looks like a fabulous place to go. Anyway, so now the date is specified here, June the 21st, 1977. 21st of June may or may not be a coincidence that in the Northern Hemisphere just happens to be Midsummer's Day. Here in the Southern Hemisphere, of course, it is Midwinter's Day. It is the shortest day of the year. So, of course, there they go onto a cargo ship, and the ship is packed full of these uh, cages with the animals in them, and that's it. They say goodbye to India. Right, and now we come to the Pacific. And there are two pictures of the Pacific <laughs> taken from an unusual perspective. The first is the Tsum Tsum sinking, and up top there you will see Pai with a large Bengal tiger, a spotted hyena, an orangutan, and a very unhappy zebra. I think by that stage in this picture the zebra was already dead, if not dying, but that gives you some idea of what happens in the next part of the sequence. Okay, they've been a few days on the ocean. They're in the ship where the crew is unfriendly and many of them don't speak any other language except uh, Chinese, the, the crew's Chinese speaking. Uh, no, don't ask me whether it's Mandarin or Cantonese, I don't know. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> If you're as nitpicky as I am, that would be an important detail to you. Okay, and um, they, everybody on board the ship is uh, surly and sulky, and they make it very clear that the uh, passengers should rather keep out of their way. They don't want anything to do with them, etc., etc. So the, the voyage is unpleasant in the beginning, but then it gets far more unpleasant <laughs> not too many days later. Okay. So here we go, from June 77 until February 78. This is, of course, the, the chunk of the story, uh, the big stuff, right? And 
What do you know? The ship starts to sink. Oops. It's a very confused description of how this happens to this you know, right at the end of the story, uh, you've got the Japanese guys coming around to question Pi on what went on, but they simply cannot establish why the Tsum Tsum sank. Nobody knows. There was lots of unusual sounds, bangs, and things flying around all over the place, but the cause cannot be established. Okay, and here we've got um, explosive noise and chaos. Lots of noise. Excitement and excitement of the wrong sort of sort. Okay, so what happens? Um, Pi gets flung into a lifeboat. He has a, a life jacket on when they drop him overboard, but it comes off. And he lands on this tarpaulin, which is, for him, is a sort of a safety net because he doesn't get injured. Okay. Um, what does get injured, of course, is the... Uh, zebra. The zebra gets flung in and hits one of the, um, the benches, breaks his leg and, well, basically shatters the bench at the same time. And there, of course, you see the, the other ones. You've got the orangutan and the hyena. And this massive <laughs> Bengal tiger. But let's take a look at how the tiger comes to get there. Now, here you've got Pi is the only human to make it onto that lifeboat. Pi's family goes down. All the crew on the boat go down. No trace left of them. Now here would initially seem a bad mistake made by Pi. And if it had been me, I would have regarded myself as having made a catastrophic mistake, not merely a bad one. I must stress here, tigers are swimmers. Normally, cats don't like water. How many of you can remember The Lion King? You know, going along there, Hakuna Matata, and you see, um, uh, um, what's his name, uh, Simba, diving into the water with uh, Pumbaa and Timon. And not bothered by water at all. In real life, that's not true. Lions don't like going into water. They don't like getting their feet wet any more than domestic cats like it. They don't have the necessary oils in their skins to protect them from the water. Whereas tigers, you know, the, the um, skin is designed to get wet. It doesn't matter. They just shake it off. Whereas most cats don't. Uh, and it's tigers. I know the Dig tigers, sorry, I'm getting tongue twisted here. The jaguars of South America also um, are swimming cats. They swim in the, the Amazon and the Orinoco and those places where they live. Uh, but for the most part, cats stay out of water wherever they can. But here you've got this tiger, and the tiger's name is Richard Parker. We'll go into that later, don't worry. It's all in these notes. And Pai says to this tiger, here, come and join me in the lifeboat. <laughs> Which <laughs> He must have been in deep shock at the time. And suddenly he's just realized, uh-oh, Bengal tigers are actually dangerous. So he jumps back into the sea quickly, <laughs> or into the sea. He hasn't been in it yet. Right, and which is... I'm sure that would be pretty much the same thing that I would do. <laughs> okay. Now, remember that the sinking takes place while the weather conditions are stormy. And none of us thinks clearly we'd be bobbing around on water and, you know, it's loud wind and rain's coming down. When it goes calm again, that's the time to think. And this is exactly what Pi does. And it's an amazing piece of detail in the book, but once again, we'll look at that a bit later. We'll, we'll read through relevant texts. And um, when um, he ends off this list of things that he's got with him, and uh, <laughs> one of the final one is, <laughs> God, I love that bit. 
Okay. Now, for quite a long time, um, the tiger has disappeared. Richard Parker has just gone. Pie doesn't seem. Then you have the incident of the, um, the hyena wiping out the zebra. And then the hyena wipes out the orangutan. And at that stage, now that it's calmed down, the tiger suddenly pops out. He's been underneath the tarpaulin hiding. And it turns out that the tiger suffers from seasickness. He gets very ill when the thing is wobbly and stuff like that. He hates it. So he lies still on the bottom of the lifeboat undercover. And it must be uh, quite a shock to suddenly discover that uh, um, a tiger is now cohabiting a restricted amount of space. Right, and there we are. Now the hyena is no more. Richard Parker sees to that. And now you've got Pi and the tiger alone, as they will be until their voyage ends seven months later. It actually says that in the book. That's how I know. Besides 227 days, I know it's June to February, and uh, besides 227 days, it also specifically says in the book seven months. Now, the one thing I didn't add to this presentation, I apologize for that, it's careless of me. One of the most important things here, which we looked at right in the beginning, is the fact that Pi builds a raft, which is attached by a rope to the boat. So it's never far from the boat, but he's um, sheltering on this raft, uh, basically to maintain a distance between him and Richard Parker. So for quite a lot of the time, he's on the raft. And this happens, that raft stays there until um, the time when they encounter another big storm. But we'll look at that in a minute. And then you see the details here. Um, surviving on canned water, right? And filtered seawater, it says. Uh, the filtered seawater is mainly done through solar stills. Okay, then he's got um, emerge. Ooh, I've made a mistake there. There's a typo. People, don't watch. You see that? Full stop there. It's supposed to be a comma. My sincere apologies. I'm not supposed to make errors of this nature. Anyway, and he talks about freshly caught sea life. He becomes quite a masterful fisherman. He's got a, a thing called a gaff, which a long pole, hook sticking out the side. And he develops this technique of hooking the fish with the spike on the side of the gaff and quickly swinging them into the boat. And he catches sea turtles, everything like that. You must remember also that um, Pi is incredibly intelligent and he is a reader. And if there's one thing I can persuade you to do, it's to read as much as possible. Because what's also, which I haven't uh, mentioned here and I should have, is the fact that he found in this lifeboat, there's this compartment with all the survival equipment in it and survival materials. And he found a book on how, basically, how to stay alive at sea in this boat. And it gives incredible advice, such as how to catch turtles and how to butcher the turtle, the sea turtles, how to butcher them and which bits you can eat and which bits you chuck away and, um, you know, the, how to tie specific knots and everything like that. And, of course, Pi reads it and he takes it in. And every time that uh, he needs more advice, he goes to this book. And the book is obviously written by somebody who knows what they're talking about. So Pi follows the advice given in this book. Let me just see. Now, here is an interesting comment. He also provides for the tiger, it says. And then he trains the tiger using a whistle. Uh, what he does is he rocks the boat, which the tiger simply hates. And whenever he rocks the boat, he whistles. And then the tiger hunches down. And when he stops rocking, 
nothing. Then the tiger is happy. But as soon as he blows that whistle, um, he establishes dominance over the tiger, over Richard Parker. And later on, in fact, he actually literally makes the tiger jump through hoops um, because he's got this tremendous knowledge of how to train animals and people, by the way. He specifically says people can also be trained in this way. Before we go on, let's take a break. And we'll be back in a minute or two. Think about what you've heard so far. This was, of course, the second part in this series of lessons on life of Pi. And at the moment, we are looking at plot. I hope to see you again in a minute or two. Otherwise, if you're watching the recording, we'll be back shortly. Goodbye for now. And welcome back. This is the third part in a series of lessons on the life of Pi, that brilliant, brilliant novel by Jan Martel. And we are still busy looking at a summary of the plot, the bits and pieces, the main parts that matter. And this is where we reached during our last session. Let's move on. Okay. And here comes the Funnily enough, the most boring bit as you read it on the board, but in actual fact, to my mind, it was incredibly fascinating. The survival techniques used and what could be used for food and um, this really strange uh, story. You know, the first time Pi deliberately kills something. A flying fish jumps into the boat. Now, for those of you who don't know flying fish, they don't really fly, of course, they glide, but they've got these huge ventral fins that stick out. And when they jump out of the water, they can glide very effectively. They use it as a method of escaping from predators such as Dorado. Well, anyway, um, Pi gets hit by a flying fish. A lot of them come flying across and he needs it for bait. So for the first time ever, he very deliberately kills something. He wraps it up in a cloth and breaks the backbone and it bothers him for the rest of his life because he had to take a conscious decision that he was going to end the life, deliberately end the life of another living thing, which he'd never done before. And since from then on, of course, the coexistence in the lifeboat and um, all these things that he described and the way the, the fish gather together underneath the boat and the, the fact that there's sharks all around but they never cause him any problems. And he talks about the colonies of these little sea creatures that uh, cluster together underneath the lifeboat, many of which can be eaten straight off. <laughs> sort of like a, a version of sushimi. Oh, the difference between sushi and sushimi. Sushi contains rice and is normally rolled up in seaweed and it can have other things inside it, such as bits of ginger or maybe some um, tuna or salmon or stuff like that and other vegetables, whereas sushimi is raw fish, okay? normally served with um, wasabi and um, soy sauce and very often sprinkled with lemon first, which just oxidizes it slightly uh, to give it just the slightly more cooked sensation. But uh, here, of course, obviously he didn't have any lemons, so he was picking these little things off from the bottom and eating them just as is. So we call this a uh, pie sushi. There's a certain irony to that. Okay, now here we go. We come to the storm. And the storm smashes up the raft and carries away from the lifeboat quite a lot of the equipment and what's left of the food supply. So now they're down to what they can catch and eat themselves. Okay. Oh, got to mention this as well. Water supply, very important, obviously. Um, if you run out of water before you run out of food, uh, you're in trouble. 
because you can last for longer without food than you can without water. Water is essential. And um, one of the things that makes it possible for um, Pi to keep Richard Parker supplied with enough water is the fact that tigers can drink salt water. It can't have too much salt in it. And he does dilute it. But he has no problem in keeping Richard Parker uh, provided with enough water. It's not a, a massive quantity, but it is enough to keep him alive. Okay, but the, during that storm, which goes on for ages, and uh, there's pie sheltering under this tarpaulin, spends the whole time just holding this tarpaulin done, gets all sorts of rash and injuries on his hands as a result. Okay, but it's a big, big storm. Okay, next, a vessel approaches. Now, Pi's got these um, flares. I don't know how many of you watching have ever played with um, survival flares from a lifeboat, but I grew up in Cape Town, and we got hold of quite a few of these things, because when their time expired, they get dumped, literally, and people just grab them, take them away. So we quite often fired these things off. It's a, a tube about that long. It's got a, you, you take your, uh, what's like a thick sticky tape off the top to release the cap. You release a cap on the same story, tape off, pull the cap off the bottom, and you've got a sort of a trigger mechanism which you simply bend around and up to the side, and as soon as you squeeze like that, there's a loud bang as this uh, flame is shot into the bottom of the rocket, and this aluminium rocket shoots upwards into the sky, and when it reach, reaches a height of, I don't know, maybe 100 meters, you get a loud pop sound, and this flare emerges and floats down on a parachute. It doesn't last very long, but it's very clearly visible from a very long way away, and um, it's distinctive. And Pi is fired off by that stage, he's fired off several of these flares, and here we come to this massive thing. I think it's an oil tanker. And it's coming towards them. And he thinks he's been seen and he's going to be rescued. The opposite is true. I mean, this tanker, uh, like any other large ship, is very, very, very difficult to stop once you're on the high seas. I mean, you're dealing with, what, 50,000 tons of moving object if it's full. And to stop that takes energy like you would not believe. Most of you watching this, I'm certain, have seen Titanic. That was a classic case in point. I mean, here you've got this sort of a 20,000 ton ocean liner, whatever the figures were. I might be wrong. Don't phone me up afterwards and say, gee, you got your figures wrong. I don't care. So there. But the point is, it's a massive heavy boat going forwards. And when they said iceberg dead ahead, um, the engines were put into full reverse. And of course, the rudder's off to one side. It had a terrible rudder, but that's besides the point. And it could not slow down to stop hitting the iceberg. I mean, now here you've got a, a much, much, much larger boat. No, it couldn't stop. It couldn't slow down. Uh, that's assuming they've even noticed this boat out in the middle of nowhere. And it's coming straight for the lifeboat. And of course, Pi gets it out of the way. And then he fires off one of his flares, maybe his last one, I don't know. And he, he's, he misses. He aims it so that it goes kabonk and uh, hits the side of the ship and doesn't go up into the air where it might, might have been seen. But anyway, a scary, scary event in their life out at sea. Okay. Then, of course, now he's been in the ocean for months now, literally months. And a combination of, here it says dehydration, but I, I suspect malnutrition as well, because by that stage, I mean, obviously he's low on um, iron in his diet. <coughs> and he goes blind, where for quite a long time he can't see. And you wouldn't, it's one of these coincidences that at exactly the same time this happens to him, it happens to another 
castaway, also drifting around the ocean on a boat. So we've got these two lifeboats approaching each other, and both of them with blind humans on board. Okay, temporarily blind, but blind nevertheless at that particular time. <clears throat> and here, this is to me one of the weirdest parts of this whole book. And there are many weird parts in this book. You've got this long, long, long conversation where the two of these guys are fantasizing about their favorite foods and how, what they wouldn't do to have these foods now. And Pai obviously talking about his traditional um, Indian foods with the, that lovely spiciness. And this, this other guy, French guy, um, uh, rambling and ranting on about the foods that he'd like to make right now and how he wishes he had some, etc., etc., etc. And this lasts for about, what, four pages where they're just fantasizing about food. And then they decide to attach their lifeboats together, which under normal circumstances would make very good sense. I mean, just think about it. You've been alone on the ocean. You've had nobody to talk to except a Bengal tiger for a couple of months. And um, I don't know about you, but I find tigers make very poor conversationalists. Um, they, they don't really speak good English either. So it's, it's always difficult to talk to them. But at least now here, now poor Pai has a hope, just a hope of company and conversation, etc., etc., and possibly some way of getting more food. And they attach their two lifeboats together, and it turns out to be a very big mistake because the other person, the cook, is not a nice person. And he doesn't see Pi as companionship or anything. He sees Pi as food. Okay, and this is what happens. So the guy tries to kill Pi. And just as he begins, um, Richard Parker steps in. And Richard Parker gets himself a nice filling treat. <laughs> which is a bit of a grim way of saying it, but that's essentially what happens. Okay, so poor Pi is back to just himself and Richard. And then we come to the very weirdest part of an essentially weird saga is the Algai Island, or also called the Mirkat Island, um, which is described as uh, botanically impossible, which technically it is. But, you know, one of my favorite quotes, um, uh, it's either from Isaac Asimov or from Arthur C. Clarke. It says, the universe is not only stranger than we imagine, it is stranger than we can imagine. And that times it ties in very closely with one of the main themes of this book, which is storytelling. And if we, you know, if we had to tell people about some of the things that we've seen, which they haven't seen, um, you know, if, if I were to describe some of my uh, experiences in nature to a person who had, for example, grown up in Tokyo, Japan, where they would be more accustomed to living in concrete circumstances, they would think very carefully before believing me because I might be lying to them to trick them. You know, um, let me just take a, um, a simple example, an ant lion. I don't know how many of you have seen ant lions, but they are very, very common throughout this country and probably throughout the world. It's a tiny little creature that burrows into sand and forms a, a funnel in the sand. And into this funnel, it hopes, an ant is going to fall. And as the ant tumbles down, it's got just its two jaws or pinches, whatever you want to call them, sticking out from under the sand. As the ant falls down into the bottom, he goes with his pinches, and then he pulls the ant, an ant under the sand and sucks it dry, and then chucks the corpse out and waits for the next one. Now, many people have never in their lives seen these things, even though they are so common all around. 
But when you tell people about it, if they haven't seen one before, they look at you and they say, this guy's making something up. It sounds too much like something out of a science fiction horror movie. But it's true. And for the record, the antline larvae, when it gets larger, um, pupates and becomes something that looks like a, a, a large dragonfly. But the whole point is that it's unbelievable until you actually see them. So next time you go walking out in the felt, make sure you keep your eyes on the ground and look for those little funnels in the sand. There's a little creature, tiny, maybe four or five millimeters long, but it's sitting at the bottom of that funnel, waiting to catch a nice tasty ant. So anyway, here we come to, sorry, I'm rambling and ranting a bit here. We come to this floating island, which is made up of algae, okay? And it's got trees growing out of it. Now, botanically, that is impossible. Trees can only grow out of earth, soil. But here it's got trees growing out. Pi points out, by the way, when they question him about this later, that do the Japanese find anything strange about having bonsai trees, you know, a tree only that size, which is 300 years old? A tree. <laughs> how, how on earth do you find a tree which is no more than a foot high and is now, has been growing for 300 years? How is it possible? Pi points out that, and um, I loved that bit of the book as well. Anyway, so Pi takes a sample of this algae. It's like, you know, seaweed. And the inside is yuck. It's bitter and salty. But the outside, sweet, delicious, nutritious, and boy, he tucks in. <laughs> so for several days... He's got this wonderful food supply. And of course, as we all know, sugar is essentially just pure energy waiting to be converted in our bodies. So obviously he's building up strength again with this algae for a few days. Let's take a look at this. Okay, um, so they explore the island. Richard Parker drifts off and comes back to the boat every night. That's significant, by the way, this, this whole thing about coming back to the boat. Um, and anyway, after a day or two, Pai walks around on the island and finds meerkats, or meerkata, as we said earlier. And obviously, Richard Parker has been feeding on these little creatures because he's getting nicely fattened up. And here we have a complete contradiction. This is pointed out that uh, Mierkata are native to the dry areas of Africa. And Bloemfontein, where I am sitting right now, is part of a dry area. And here on this island, the Mierkata are swimmers. They dive into freshwater ponds to catch uh, a fish, or more technically to extract the fish from the pond. The fish are dead already. And they nibble on this algae, and that's how they stay alive. And again, technically, that's impossible, but this is what is being described. And then, of course, every night, uh, Pai discovers, because uh, he himself decides to get to sleep in the trees some evenings, and when he's up in the trees, the, well, the trees are just full of mirkata, including on him, these uh, um, Mirkata and their kittens and everything drape themselves all over him because now he's a nice warm body and they're sharing body heat. Okay, but now we start to come to the fact, why are these Mirkata always in the trees at night and always on the ground in the daytime? Um, well, while he's up in the tree, Pai discovers that there's these, these funny looking fruits in the tree and he thinks, but gee, if the owl guy is this delicious? What are those fruits going to be like? And of course, eventually he gets up there and he opens up one of the fruits and he discovers it's not fruit at all. It's a bundle, layer after layer after leaves, of leaves, all wrapped around something. And when he finally gets the leaves off, he finds one human tooth. And he goes to the other 31 of these fruits until he's got a collection of 32 human teeth. In other words, the full contents of one human mouth. All right. And he, work, he works out. The island becomes acidic at night 
acidic to the point of lethal. And that's why the um, mere cutter won't go down from out of the trees at night because the, the ground is, is potently acidic. Richard Parker also, that's why he won't stay on the island at night is because it's acidic and he got injured when he did that. He always goes back to the boat. And at that point, Pai says, no, let's get out of here. <laughs> this is not good. And then we don't know for how much longer he carries on drifting, but, oh, sorry, before I move on. I have often asked myself, why is all of the story perfectly scientific and believable, <coughs> but the story of the Mirkat Island is not logical? Why? Could it be that the algae did not merely contain sugars and nutrition, could it perhaps be that it contained the active ingredient of something like magic mushrooms? So that pie wound up hallucinating? I don't know. But to me, it's an answer that is entirely logical to explain this irrational part of this story. Uh, talking about irrational, the number pi is itself described as irrational because even though we know exactly how big the number is, we can't, sorry, let's rephrase it. We know exactly what the number is. In other words, it's the ratio between the circle and the square. But we can't narrow it down to an exact figure. It's been done up to over, what, five million uh, numerals the last I checked, and they still hadn't got to the end. So I'm not sure how far it's ever going to go, but to this day, nobody has ever calculated pi with absolute precision. Finally, the journey ends in Mexico, of all places, right? Um, what actually happens, they see the shore coming in, it's waves breaking onto a shore. Um, Pi makes one last effort. He gets up and he steers the lifeboat using the sea anchor, in other words, the stuff dragging it to make sure that it always faces into the wind. And he manages to get it through the, the waves and then it crunches up onto the sea and he jumps out of the boat and he's on land for the first time in 200 and slightly more than 227 days. First time in seven months he's actually on firm land. And the last he sees of Richard Parker, the, the tiger, jumps out of the boat right over him, very thin and bedraggled by then, and simply walks off into the jungle or the forest past the beach, and he's gone. That's it. Vanished. Pi is, of course, discovered by some of the people who live in the vicinity, and they take him off to the nearest hospital. And that, well, they take him back to their houses, to be quite honest. And um, the police come and they take him off to a hospital. And at that point, the saga of the Pacific ends. Now, I think this is an appropriate moment, of course, to take a break because we have got to the end of the main part and now uh, we'll just take a few minutes off before we look at the final part of the story. I'm, uh, so just a reminder, this was the third part in our um, lessons on the life of Pi. We looked at this in this part again at a summary of the plot and we'll be back again in a few minutes. Goodbye for now. And welcome back. This is the fourth part in our series of presentations on the life of Pi. And we have now just reached the end of Pi's long boat journey, <laughs> all 227 days of it, when he washes up in a beach in Mexico. And for those of you who are wondering, 
this is what the journey would have looked like. There we have left, okay, you've got to allow for the fact that this is on a, a flattened map. If it were a, a globe of the world, it would in fact look um, as if it were a shorter distance. But there you've got from the time here that the symptom goes down, um, he meanders sort of randomly across the Pacific Ocean with a, an encounter here with, of course, the Mirkat Island, and then Tomatlan in Mexico. And any of you who speak Spanish, if you want to fight about my pronunciation, Come back and do it after the broadcast. I'm not going to listen to you now. <laughs> but I think it's pronounced as Tomatlan. Because it's got a on top of the final letter A. Okay. So there it is. All the way across the largest ocean on the planet. So, let's take a look. Five days after the lifeboat touches down on that uh, beach... He is now in a, um, a hospital, or here it's called the Benito Juarez Infirmary. Okay, it's in Tomatlan in Mexico. Right. Now, um, you have the problem facing the Japanese owners of the boat. It's obviously a large shipping company with many boats. And obviously, for insurance purposes, they want to know what happened to the Tsum Tsum. They know it's gone down by now. But they need to know why the boat sank. So, finally, they've heard that there is a survivor. Because obviously, something like this, a, um, a survivor um, arriving on dry land, you know, seven months after the actual wreck takes place, almost unheard of. And obviously now they want to know what happened to the boat. So these two Japanese guys pitch up there now to question Pai and to ask him what happened to their boat. Let's take a look at this here. You've got this. It's um, Mr. Okamoto and Mr. Chiba. And once again, our um, Yan Martel has got an amazing sense of humor. Because as far as I know, the Japanese word um, okamoto means condom. Okay, now why it's done like that, I don't know. But he's not the nice guy. Mr. Okamoto is the senior one who's sort of rude and bossy and stuff. When we go into character later, incidentally, we'll cover that. But they come to talk to Pai and they want to know how did the, the ship sink? What caused it to sink? Okay. So, now at this point, Pai tells the story. But these Japanese guys simply don't believe him. Especially, obviously, the part about the Algai Island or the Mirkat Island, whatever you want to hear. Okay, so, we'll go towards the, uh, towards the end, but then we're going to do a little bit of reading as well. Okay, so here we get, oh dear, once again, I've made an editing error, my sincere apologies. Okay, um, Pi has come out with an A in it, and I must explain here <laughs> that I was doing this to a very great extent using um, speech to text. Very convenient, I simply speak into the computer and the words appear on the screen, but it sometimes gets the spelling wrong. For interest, it had no problem with the spelling of um, Okamoto or Chiba. Got the spelling perfect. But for some reason, Pai comes out either as P-A-I, or it comes out as P-I-E, or it comes out as the um, mathematical symbol, Pi. <laughs> when it's done speech to text. So it's, it was the most amusing time I had setting this recording up, uh, this, this presentation up. And that was one of the things that I had to be careful about was the way it always mangled the word pie. It always mangled the word pie. It never got it right at all. But anyway, sorry about that. 
Okay, so he tells the story again. And this time, he switches around the animals for the humans. Okay, and of course, you've got this ghastly cook uh, representing the hyena. You've got a sailor instead of the zebra. And of course, in this part of the story, his mother survives long enough to make it onto the lifeboat. Okay, now... Now, the, the two Japanese guys say that the second story is more believable. They use the word there, credible. But the first story is a better story. <laughs> and if you want my opinion on it, I don't know if you've reached the end of the book yet. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Um, but I far prefer the first story. <laughs> The second one is gruesome and barbaric and nasty. One of the um, items of advice that we always give uh, when we're doing um, training for essays, we want to enjoy reading whatever it is that you've written. We are humans. We read for pleasure. All of us who mark the, um, the final essays, we are readers as well as being you know, probably most of us write quite a lot as well, but be that as it may. Um, and we want to enjoy what we're reading. And if you look at the second story, it's absolutely horrible. And we're going to look at it now on purpose, just to show you um, what I mean by that. But it's most unpleasant. So, um, just while we do that, in their report, please note, it's in the final report. <laughs> they don't say, hey, we believe the first one, but they hint at the fact that the story um, of being alive with the tiger for 227 days um, is better. <laughs> and that's one of the themes of this book, is this whole thing about the power of storytelling. Oh, and for the record, what I didn't include here, they left Pi absolutely uninformed and very hungry, but that's another, that's another story. They did not have any information as to what actually caused the ship to go down. All, they, all that Pi could tell them was about a loud bang and a sort of a, um, a burping sound as the ship went under the water. And um, that was that. He couldn't give them any information. So after their, their long, long journey, oh dear, too bad, so sad, they still don't know why it sank. And um, so that's just to add insult to injury for these poor, unfortunate Japanese guys who drove something like 40 hours to finally reach Pai. And um, after all that trouble, and after Pai rips off all their food, <laughs> they've got nothing to show for it. <laughs> this brilliant little bit of comedy. Let's take a look. And now I'm going to read um, the the second story. Um, and we'll start from, for those of you that have got the book, I'm going to start from page 286. And I'm hoping that your edition is the same as mine. I believe it is, because I've only ever seen this one used in the schools. So, sorry, while I do a little bit of setting up here. And here is my document scanner. And I'll need a nice heavy weight. Well, it may not be as heavy as a Nokia, but it's still quite a good cell phone. There, it makes quite a good paperweight. Now, let me see if I can go to the document reader. And I have done so. So we go to this. And here we have, I'm just going to see, um, if one of the camera operators could maybe zoom in more for me. Um, would you be able to come and make this thing zoom closer? Okay. My friend, the camera operator here, has, of course, his master's degree in uh, production technology. There we are. That's great. So he can do things with this technology that I can't do. Right, so here we are, page 282. You can see it in the top corner there. And 
let's go up to the bottom of the page. You can see chapter 96. And what does it say? Right? Now, uh, just for the record, when they speak pure Japanese, it's in what looks like handwritten text. When Pi speaks, it's in the normal... Sorry, well, most of the stuff is just in normal text. Okay, and it's got, Hello, Mr. Patel. My name is uh, Tomohiro Okamoto. I am from the Maritime Department in the Japanese Ministry of Transport. This is my assistant, As um, Atsuro Chiba. We have come to see you about the sinking of the ship Tsinsum, uh, on which you were a passenger. Sorry, this, is, this book is a bit new. Would it be possible to talk to you now? Yes, of course. Boy, I'm starting to feel like I'm a ship on the high seas myself. There we are. Okay, in position. Thank you. It is very kind of you. Now, uh, and now he speaks in Japanese. You can see by the change in the font. Now, at, at Suru, uh, what's it? Atsuru Kun. Yeah, Atsuru Kun. In other words, he's speaking down to Mr. Chiba. You knew at this, so pay attention and seek to learn. Yes, Okamato san. In other words, yes, honorable Mr. Okamato. Is the tape recorder on? Yes, it is. Good. Oh, I'm so tired. <laughs> Incidentally, these guys had a horrible trip. They got totally lost. They went to the wrong place, and they wound up spending about 40 hours in the hired car. Mm. Right. Uh, case file number, da-da-da-da-da, concerning the disappearance of the cargo ship Tsinsum. Are you comfortable, Mr. Patel? Yes, I am. Thank you. And you? We are very comfortable. Liar, liar, pants on fire. He's in a miserable condition. You've come all the way from Tokyo? We were in Long Beach, California. We drove down. Did you have a good trip? We had a wonderful trip. It was a beautiful drive. Again, a lie. It was a horrible drive. And Pai says, somewhat sarcastically, I had a terrible trip. Yes, we spoke to the police before coming here and we saw the lifeboat. Note that they saw the lifeboat, but they didn't actually check the contents too well. I'm a little hungry. Not a very subtle hint, that. Would you like a cookie? Oh, yes. Here you go. Thank you. You're welcome. It's only a cookie. This guy can't understand why he gets so excited about a mere cookie. But the whole thing is, like any other castaway, of course, Pi is now a survivor and he becomes a food hoarder because he knows the importance of having a lot of food ready at all times. Okay. Now, Mr. Patel, we were wondering if you could tell us what happened to you with as much detail as possible. Yes, I'd be happy to. Okay, let's turn over. Oh, sorry, before we turn over, we go down to the bottom. Now, chapter 97 is the shortest in the book. You see what it says there? The story. In other words, all the previous 280 pages go into that bit there. The story. Okay. Now, just for the record, this is a, uh, according to the author, this is a direct transcript of what happened when Pai was interviewed by the Japanese people. So he's got it absolutely, and he can take it down word for word. Let us turn over. Right. And here we have, now these guys have listened, and now Mr. Akamoto says, very interesting. Mr. Chiba says, what a story. Okay, he thinks we're fools. <laughs> Mr. Patel, we'll take a little break and then we'll come back, yes? That's fine. I'd like another cookie. <laughs> yes, of course. Mr. Chiba comments in Japanese, of course. He's already had plenty and most he hasn't even eaten there right there beneath his bed sheet. <laughs> the reply, just give him another one. We have to humor him. We'll be back in a few minutes. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> um, now they return, chapter 99. And just for the record, this book has exactly 100 chapters. I do not believe that is a coincidence. I believe that the author did that deliberately just to round it off nicely. Okay. Right. Mr. Patel, we don't believe your story. Um, and then he replies, Pi replies, sorry, these cookies are good, but they tend to crumble. I'm amazed. Why not? 
it doesn't hold up. What do you mean? Bananas don't float. Oops. I'm sorry? You said the orangutan came floating on an island of bananas. That's right. Bananas don't float. Yes, they do. They're too heavy. No, they're not. Here, try for yourself. I have two bananas right here. Mr. Chiba. <laughs> Where did those come from? What else does he have under his bed sheet? Mr. Okamoto. Damn it. Uh, no, that's all right. There's a sink over there. Now, Pi is catching them out beautifully. Um, that's fine. I insist. Full sink with water. Drop those bananas and we'll see who's right. We'd like to move on. I absolutely insist. Silence. <laughs> Mr. Chiba, <laughs> what do we do? Mr. Okamoto, I feel this is going to be another very long day. Sound of a chair being pushed back. Remember, this is a recording. We are essentially looking at a transcript of a recording here. Sound of a chair being pushed back. Distant sound of water gushing out of a tap. By Patel. What's happening? I can't see from here. Mr. Okamoto, distantly. I'm filling the sink. Have you put the bananas in yet? No. And now? They're in. And? Oops. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> are they floating? They're floating. So are they floating? <laughs> They're floating. What did I tell you? Yes, yes. But it would take a lot of bananas to hold up an orangutan. It did. It was close to a ton. It still makes me sick when I think of all those bananas floating away and going to waste when they were mine for the picking. It's a pity. Now about... Could I have my bananas back, please? <laughs> Mr. Chiba, I'll get them. <laughs> Etc. Look at that. They really do float. All in Japanese, of course. What about this Algai Island you say you came upon? Here are your bananas. Thank you. Yes? <laughs> you see, this is... I think Pai is teasing them like crazy here. <clears throat> we carry on here. I'm sorry to say it so bluntly, we don't mean to hurt your feelings, but you don't really expect us to believe, do you? Carnivorous trees? Fish-eating algae that produces fresh water? Tree-dwelling aquatic rodents? These things don't exist. <laughs> and this is a very good reply. Only because you've never seen them. That's right. We believe what we see. So did Columbus. Of course, Columbus is the guy that first, um, the first European um, to sail into the, uh, what we today call the Americas. Okay. Although it's very likely that, of course, the Vikings were there before that, but that's another story. What do you do when you're in the dark? Your island is botanically impossible. Reply from Pi. Yes, yeah, said the fly just before landing in the Venus flytrap. <laughs> Funnily enough, I was looking at Venus flytraps uh, recently, once again, a YouTube video. And yes, I mean, if somebody had invented that as um, in a giant version of that and used it in a horror movie, well, maybe they have done that. I, mean, I think it was done in Little Shop of Horrors or something like that. But it's a truly horrifying looking thing. The way you've got this insect walking around and suddenly the fly trap just goes, almost clicks shut. The insect struggles for a bit and then stops struggling very quickly as it gets squished. Next question. Why has no one else come across upon it? And Pai says, big ocean crossed by busy ships. I went slowly, observing much. No scientist would believe you. Um, these would have been the same who dismissed Copernicus and Darwin. Have scientists finished coming upon new plants in the Amazon basin, for example? Okay, now I want to comment there. Um, for many years, I used to walk alongside the road um, between the town where I stayed and the one closest to me. You would not believe the difference between what you see and what you hear and what you smell and what you sense when you are driving in a car and when you are actually on the road on your feet with everything around you. And I can fully identify with Pai's argument here is that, you know, people see but they do not observe. And the other thing is they don't, um, they don't use all their senses. 
just for example, where we're staying, um, I'm continually, we've got dams all around us. I'm continually hearing fish eagles. I have only once ever seen one. And yet I know they're there. And for more than a year since we moved into that place, um, I never saw one. Even though my ears told me, they're there. I know the sound of a fish eagle. Um, we had them in the, the previous place where we stayed as well. But, <laughs> you know, it's this whole thing about what senses are you using? When I drive, um, my wife always laughs at me. She says, hey, do you see that? And I'll look around and say, hey, what? Because when I'm driving, my attention is focused on the road. I don't have time to look around. You know, you've got to avoid having accidents and uh, you've got to make sure that you're staying on your side of the road or you don't drift off the road or if, if there's a pothole ahead that you've got to avoid or something like that. And that's where my attention is. <coughs> and in the same way, um, it's perfectly possible for an island like this to exist and has never been seen by anybody or never have been noticed by anybody. They may have just thought it was a, a clump of vegetation or something. Perfectly, perfectly possible to my mind. Um, <clears throat> we'll carry on with this again in a few minutes. We're going to take a short break and then just a reminder this was the fourth part in the series of presentations on um, the life of Pi. Uh, let me just, sorry, let me just uh, switch back to, there we are. Okay. Now, hopefully, the camera is on me. Um, my apologies for that. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. And this is the fourth part in our series of presentations on the life of Pi. We are still dealing with the plot. And when we come back, we're going to finish off with the final story. I hope that you enjoyed it. See you now. Welcome back to those of you who are joining us live today and to those of you who are joining the um, or watching the next episode. It is the fifth one and this is in our series on the life of Pi. We are still looking at the basics of the plot and we are going to continue now by carrying on reading um, the second story given by Pi after the Japanese guys refuse to believe the first one. They say it's too unlikely. So let me switch over to this amazing document scanner gadget here, which has been carefully set by me, sorry, for me, by the guy with the masters in techno gear. Right, and we're on, for those of you that are wondering, we're on page 286. I'm pretty sure anybody watching this is going to have the same copy of the book that I have. If not, well, sorry about that. We're on chapter 99. <laughs> and there are 100 chapters in the book that will give you a very good idea about where we are right now. So, uh, we got past the, uh, the fact that... Um, right, they don't believe his story of the Algar Island. Good. Now, let's go to, uh, I'll just point with my finger, here. Uh, and Pi asks, have scientists finished coming, up, uh, coming upon new plants in the Amazon basin, for example? Not plants that contradict the laws of nature? And then an automatic reply, which you know through and through, very sarcastic. Well enough to know the possible from the impossible. And then Mr. Chiba kicks in. I have an uncle who knows a lot about botany. He lives in the country near Hitagun. He's a bonsai master. And Piper Till, a what? A bonsai master. You know, bonsai are little trees. You mean shrubs? No, I mean trees. Bonsai are little trees. They are less than two feet tall. You can carry them in your arms. They can be very old. My uncle has one that is over three, 300 years old. And now we get the rhetorical question from Pi. 300 year old trees that are two feet tall and you can carry in your arms. Yes, they're very delicate. They need a lot of attention. 
Whoever heard of such trees? They're botanically impossible. <laughs> oh, isn't that brilliant? Okay. Um, now, uh, let's move on and let's look at um, Pi's second story. Okay. Right, let's find that. Um, right, and here on page 294 is where the, the second story begins. I'll bring it up here. Right, let's see if we've got it. Okay, after long silence. There you can see long silence. And Pi says, here's another story. Good. That good is, of course, <laughs> a case of, ah, caught you out. The ship sank. It made a sound like a monstrous metallic burp. Things bubbled at the surface and then vanished. I found myself kicking water in the Pacific Ocean. I swam for the lifeboat. It was the hardest swim of my life. I didn't seem to be moving. I kept swallowing water. I was very cold. I was rapidly losing strength. I wouldn't have made it if the cook hadn't thrown me a life boy and pulled me in. I climbed aboard and collapsed. Four of us survived. Mother held on to some bananas and made it to the lifeboat. The cook was already aboard, as was the sailor. He ate the flies, the cook that is. We hadn't been in the lifeboat a full day. We had food and water to last us for weeks. We had fishing gear and solar stills. We had no reason to believe that we wouldn't be rescued soon. Yet there he was, swinging his arms and catching flies and eating them greedily. Right away, he was a holy terror of hunger. He called us idiots and fools for not joining him in the feast. We were offended and disgusted, but we didn't show it. Now, let's just pause at that point. Yuck! Eating flies! Sis! I'm fairly uh, courageous in what I eat, and I've eaten many things that other people wouldn't. Um, but flies, ugh. I mean, they're so small. They are disgusting. They are filthy and unhygienic. And um, to, to think of eating them for nourishment, not me, thank you very much. I'll leave that to chickens and birds that uh, eat chochas. Not something for me. I mean, yuck, disgusting. Okay. Then we go up to this paragraph here. And this is why I say this story is unpleasant. It's nasty. Here we go here. Um, the sailor was young. Actually, he was older than me, probably in his early 20s. But he broke his leg jumping. Sorry, let me just see if I can tilt this slightly so we can see it there. He broke his leg, jumping from the ship, and his suffering made him a child. He was beautiful. He had no facial hair at all. The clear, shining complexion, etc., etc. Go down to here. His right leg was badly broken at the thigh. The bone stuck out of his flesh. He, we, he screamed with pain. We set his leg as best we could, and we made sure he was eating and drinking, but his leg became infected. Though we drained it of pus every day, it got worse. His foot became black and bloated. Okay. Again, not a pleasant story. Yuck. His right leg was bad. Uh, sorry. Here. It was the cook's idea. He was a brute. He dominated us. He whispered that the blackness would spread and that he would, own, he would survive only if his leg were amputated. Since the bone was broken at the thigh, it would involve no more than cutting through the flesh and setting a tourniquet. I can still hear his evil whisper. Okay. So they did it. Right. They amputated his leg. Uh, then he clung to life but Dawny was still alive he went in and out of consciousness mother gave him water I caught sight of the amputated leg it cut my breath, breath short in the commotion it had been shoved aside and forgotten in the dark it had seeped to liquid and looked thinner I took a life jacket and used it as a glove I picked the leg up what are you doing? asked the cook I'm going to throw it overboard don't be an idiot. We'll use it as bait. That was the whole point. Okay. 
The whole point, mother asked. What do you mean by that? Again, mother's voice rose. Are you telling us that we cut this poor boy's leg off not to save his life, but to get fishing bait? Etc. And once again, very nasty. And we move on. And um, she points out that they had plenty of food, except that she took hold of the plastic container in which we put the open rations of biscuits. It was unexpectedly light in her hands. The few crumbs in it rattled. What? She opened it. Where are the biscuits? The container was full last night. The cook looked away, as did I. You selfish monster, screamed mother. The only reason we're running out of food is because you're gorging yourself on it. He had some too, he said, nodding my way. Mother's eyes turned to me. My heart sank. Bicene, is that true? It was night, mother. I was half asleep and I was so hungry. He gave me a biscuit. I ate it without thinking. Only one, was it? Sneered the cook. Okay. And um, it goes on. Right. Um. There we are now. The um, the Chinese sailor dies. Okay. And he butchers the the carcass. Right. Sculpt him pulled off his face. Yaxis. It says that there the cook threw himself upon the sailor's head and before our very eyes sculpt him. In other words, cut off the um, the hair on the uh, the top of the head and pulled off the face. Ooh. Skinning. Okay, when he had finished, he threw the, the butchered carcass overboard. Shortly after, strips of flesh and pieces of organs were lying to dry in the sun all over the boat. Okay, um, then, the next time the cook was close by, mother slapped him in the face. A full hard slap that punctuated the air with a sharp crack. It was something shocking coming from my mother, and it was heroic. It was an act of outrage and pity and grief and bravery. Um... Okay. Mother kept an eye on him. Two days later, she saw him do it. She tried to be discreet, but she saw him bring his hand to his mouth. She shouted, I saw you. You just ate a piece. You said it was for baits. I knew it. You monster. You animal. How could you? He's human. He's your own kind. Okay. And so he's become cannibalistic now. Okay. Then, right at the bottom over here, um, he killed her. The cook killed my mother. We were starving. I was weak. I couldn't hold on to the turtle. Because of me, we lost it. He hit me. Mother hit him. He hit her back. She turned to me and said, go, pushing me towards the raft. I jumped for it. I thought she was coming with me. I landed in the water. I scrambled aboard the raft. They were fighting. I did nothing but watch. My mother was fighting an adult man. He was mean and muscular. He caught her by the wrist and twisted it. She shrieked and fell. He moved over her. The knife appeared. He raised it up in the air. It came down. Next it was up. It was red. It went up and down repeatedly. I couldn't see her. She was at the bottom of the boat. I saw only him. He stopped. He raised his head and looked at me. He hurled something my way. A lion of blood struck me across my face. No whip could have inflicted a more painful lash. I held my mother's head in my hands. I let it go. It sank in a cloud of blood, her tress trailing like a fish. Okay. Um, then it says here, fish spiraled down towards it until the shark's long gray shadow cut across its path and had vanished. I looked up. I couldn't see him. He was hiding at the bottom of the boat. He appeared when he threw my mother's body overboard. His mouth was red. Yuck! So he's been munching on another human body, and this time fresh killed. Not a pleasant sight. Okay. And then, of course, we have Pi now. Um, at the bottom there, it says, The knife was all along in plain view on the bench. We both knew it. 
He could have had it in his hands from the start. He was the one who put it there. I picked it up. I stabbed him in the stomach. He grimaced but remained standing. I pulled the knife out and stabbed him again. Blood was pouring out. Still, he didn't fall over. Looking me in the eyes, he lifted his head ever so slightly. Did he mean something by this? I took it that he did. I stabbed him in the throat next to the Adam's apple. He dropped like a stone and died. He didn't say anything. He had no last words. He only coughed up blood. A knife has a horrible dynamic power. Once it's in motion, it's hard to stop. I stabbed him repeatedly. His blood soothed my chapped hands. His heart was a struggle, all those tubes that connected it. I managed to get it out. It tasted delicious, far better than turtle. I ate his liver. I cut off great pieces of his flesh. He was such an evil man. Worse still, he met evil in me. Selfishness, anger, ruthlessness. I must live with that. Solitude began. I turned to God. I survived. <laughs> horrible, horrible story. Okay? Not nice at all. And... Interestingly en enough, you've got there the next thing, the stage direction, whatever you want to call it, long silence. Okay, and th this very sarcastic question, is that better? Are there any parts you find hard to believe? Anything you'd like me to change? What a horrible story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, then Mr. Okamoto, ever the practical. Both the zebra and the Taiwanese sailor broke a leg. Did you notice that? No, I didn't. And the hyena bit off the le lebra's egg just as the cook cut off the sailors. Oh, Okamoto-san, you see a lot. The blind Frenchman they met in the other lifeboat. Didn't he admit to killing a man and a woman? Yes, he did. The cook killed the sailor and his mother. Very impressive. His stories match. So the Taiwanese sailor is the zebra. His mother is the orangutan. The cook is the hyena, which means he's the tiger. Yes, the tiger killed the hyena and the blind Frenchman, just as he killed the cook. And that is the whole thing about Pi. It's the story, the story, the story. Which story is the credible one? Most of us would say, we'll stick with the first one. Because... Well, for obvious reasons. It's a good story. It's, it's sad, but it's sad in a Shakespearean tragedy type of way. You've got uh, Pi's family being lost through no fault of their own. Uh, you've got this interaction between animals, which isn't a bad interaction. Um, yes, I mean, you've got predators doing what predators are doing, which is killing and eating other animals. But that's part of nature. You can accept that. It's not um, absolute abandonment of conscience or anything like that. Um, and it's inspirational and it's educational. You've got uh, Pi going to enormous lengths to survive and working out <coughs> various methods of keeping himself alive. The primary one being, you know, how can he coexist with a Bengal tiger on a lifeboat which is basically 28 feet long? It's, um, if I remember... <laughs> <coughs> from the story, 28 feet long, 8 feet wide, and about 3.5 feet deep, Okay, with benches all around the outside and running across the middle, and it can hold something like 30 people in it. And, you know, really, um, that first story, which goes on for a long time indeed, is far more inspirational than Pai just sitting alone in this lifeboat and um, eating whatever fish and turtles and uh, barnacles and stuff he can gather up to survive. It's got something to it. But the other part of the story is, of course, the religious aspect. Pai often, um, in the first story, the long one, he struggles about his uh, uh, faith you know, believing uh, that God is going to keep him alive and, you know, seeing storms coming and knowing that uh, the chances are that he's gone. And uh, when, he's, when the storm has ended or when he comes across a, a nice large um, sea turtle or when it rains and he's got plenty of water to drink, the way he gives thanks, which is, again, a very good way 
to actually behave, is to be grateful for things. And again, part of my own um, philosophy of existence. You know, you say thank you every little, every day that you live is another gift from God. Okay, I know I'm being subjective here. This is um, my own philosophy of life, but it's, it's very much in line with Pai's philosophy of life. So, and another reason why I am so very fond of this book. But there, people, I think we have dealt enough with the plot. Um, just a bit of background here before we take a break. The reason why I started with plot, this is a reminder, is that I want to make sure that I'm leaving a record here, and I know that there, there's a recording being made of this, and that's another reason why I'm being so careful about exactly what I cover first. This recording is primarily going to be useful um, in the third term of the year as a method of revision and as a method of ensuring that all the content in the book has been covered. I know that. And when we go on to our next section, then we're looking at characters, of course. But again, it is a revision section. But for those of you that are still going through the book for the first time, you're going to find it massively useful. Because remember that almost all the characters, except the, uh, the French cook and the Japanese officials, um, appear in the uh, middle of the book. Sorry, uh, at the, uh, the beginning of the book beginning towards the first one-third. So by now, you should have encountered most of them. This is just my way of saying, this is how we make sure that you are fully prepared for those exams. We'll stop for a few minutes then. Just a reminder, this was the fifth part in a series of presentations on Life of Pi. We've been looking strictly at the plot. In other words, the, the story itself up until now. Um, so far, so good. I'm going to say goodbye just for a few minutes. See you again shortly. And welcome back to those of you who are watching us live. I'm sorry about the longer pause than normal. This is the sixth in our series of lessons on the life of Pi by Yann Martel. And in this one, we are going to be looking at the characters. Now, um, just for the record, um, I've said before, I'll say it again, this is one of my favorite books, and I hope that well, as we go through it, you will derive as much pleasure from this as I do. It's really a book that is well written, it's original, it's fresh, and in many ways, it continually reminds me of the ideal type of essays that I wish the guys would write, that um, it's something which we've never encountered before. Nobody has ever tried a story of this nature before. So, hats off to Jan, Mart Jan Martel. In fact, I'll do it literally, not just figuratively. That is for Jan Martel. I respect the guy's writing talent. And let's take a look then at our characters in the life of Pi. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this because it's confusing, if you don't. Now, the whole thing starts with this account by the visiting writer or the fictitious author or whoever you want to call him or whatever you want to call him. Um, his name is never given. On the screen, you'll see a picture of Jan Martel, obviously. But um, we don't know what the guy's name is. And even though he, falls, he forms um, the whole grounding person in this whole thing, we have no information about him, except that until then, he was never a successful author. His previous books were um, critically acclaimed, but never read by many people. <laughs> And he's, uh, the one on which he was then working, he says he mailed to a fictitious address in Siberia or something. I don't know. Um, he says he was just so disappointed with it. Okay. Now, here we have the fact that, in all likelihood, it is Jan Martel himself. But we don't know. So we must be very careful about stating facts like that. It's not 
anywhere given in the book. Right? And he's from Canada. Now, Yann Mortel himself is, of course, from Canada. And, well, not from Canada, but um, uh, speaks French. Uh, he was originally from other places. He's, uh, apparently, he's, his father was a diplomat. Um, so he learned a whole variety of languages overseas. I can't remember all those details, though. I haven't included this in the presentation because it's not absolutely essential to it. Here we are focusing strictly on what's actually in the book. Um, all I can say is Jan Martel speaks French as well as English and probably other languages also. Okay, from Canada. And once again, we say that a country that is so friendly to immigration. And here it says, during a visit to India, he comes across somebody who tells him this almost unbelievable story about this really incredible person. And what does he do? He goes across and he meets up with Pai. And that's when the, the story of uh, the Pondicherry Zoo and everything like that begins. And now let's look at our fictitious writer or visiting author or whatever. And there are his various character traits given. Insightful. In other words, observant. He picks up on details. When, for example, he's interacting with the Patel family uh, in Toronto, he notices this plethora of details in the house. And um, he gives such a fine, fine descriptions of these things. So he, he picks up everything. He would have made a fabulous police detective. For those of you that have ever come across it, there was a series back in the 70s called Columbo, a TV series about this um, not very clean, um, shabby, cigar-smoking police detective um, who never missed a single detail. And this guy reminds me of a modern version of that. Okay. Now we get our Mr. Francis um, Adurubasami. And again, if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, sue me. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll fight you to my last cent in court. <laughs> but I think I'm pretty close, even if I'm not being absolutely exact. Obviously, I can't tell with my lack of experience of the, the languages of India, I can't tell you exactly where the stress is going to fall, and I can't tell you which of the sounds should be neutral and which should be pronounced as the letters, uh, in the letters in which they're written. I just simply don't know. But I think I'm getting it correct. Okay, and this guy um, is the uh, creator of Pi's ability to swim. Now, we must emphasize this. The characters with whom Pi interacts at a young age are the ones who prepare him to survive in a lifeboat for all that length of time. We're talking about here uh, the fact that he can swim, and swim well, whereas the rest of his family can't. And they all went down with the ship. Um, okay, then you've got, um, well, we'll stick with Mr. Adrabasimi for now. And let's just go through his um, details. The first thing to remember is as soon as you chuck this uh, G sound onto the end of a word, uh, it becomes a word showing great respect in the same way as in um, Japanese. If you chuck the word San on the back of a, of a person's name, it means honorable. So when Mr. Chiba addresses Mr. Okamoto, he addresses him as Mr. Okamoto-san, uh, you know, honorable. And then um, Chiba is addressed in turn as uh, Chiba-kun, which I presume uh, is not honorable, uh, just normal. 
Okay, old friend of the Patel family, knew, knew Pai's father very well for a long time. Okay. And here we have this fact. We looked at it in the beginning. Um, Mr. Adiru Basami knows all the swimming pools in Paris. And he describes many of them as sewers. <laughs> now, of course, we all know that the, um, the River Seine, once again, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing it correctly, flows through the middle of Paris. And as is the case when a river goes through um, areas where people live, it becomes polluted. I don't know of any exceptions to that rule. Even in the high mountains of Lesotho, where I have frequently been, um, you know, like close to Mokotlong, um, uh, high up, and there are streams and rivers there, but as soon as somebody is living next to them, those rivers are polluted. Don't drink the water. I made that mistake once, but once only. Don't drink that water. Very bad idea. It is polluted. And this is the same thing with the swimming pools where they are filled by the waters of the Seine. They are nasty and they are dirty and they are not pleasant places in which to swim. I don't know if that is still the case. I presume with modern filtration equipment and all the gadgets that go with swimming pools, I presume it is perfectly possible to produce pools with sparkling clear water. It should be. But this was the case um, in those days. So let us not uh, uh, question uh, and let us not try to take something out of context and out of its uh, particular setting. Because now we're talking about a setting in, uh, if Pi was uh, 16 years old in 1970, then he must have been named in uh, 1961. Yes, okay. So we are going back to 1961 because that's when he got his name, right? And in those days, definitely um, one of the few clean pools, which was fed by its own spring, as far as I recall, is the Piscine Molitor in Paris. It was clean and it was lovely. It was a lovely pool in which to swim. And of course, there we have the expert who tells us about this. Great. Now, he um, doesn't literally introduce Pi to the visiting writer. What he does is he tells um, the visiting writer or the unknown author, about Pai Patel, um, who had this incredible experience on the Pacific Ocean for such a long time. And obviously, now, the, anybody who hears a story like that, which verges on impossible, wants to go verify it. You want to make sure that this is not only possible, but it actually happened, it's true. And he does exactly that. But we'll go back to that in a second. I'm going back to plot, whereas I should be focusing on characters right now. And here is the, the obvious comment. Um, Mr. Adurubasami is a, a champion swimmer. And he actually tried to teach Pai's entire family to swim, but they weren't interested. Um, they thought that he was trying to drown Pai by continually making him go into water. But as it turned out, the opposite is true. He allowed Pai to stay alive, to stay alive on the lifeboat for many months. Okay. Right. So he's our number two character. Incidentally, these characters are very much in order of appearance. Right. So you'll find uh, Mr. Ad uh, Adurubasami is one of the first people encountered um, during that um, author's note part in the... Uh, very beginning of the story, before the story begins, in fact, before chapter one. Okay, Piscine Molitor Patel. Okay, protagonist of the story. The protagonist means the hero, 
or the main character. And it's on the lifeboat, 1977. Here are his character traits, and we're going to go through this fairly slowly because obviously it makes a difference. Without this particular range of character traits, he wouldn't have made it. So with, remember, these character traits really matter. Right, there we are. Um, all good guy traits. Vegetarian. Um, not for me, thank you. I'm very much a meat eater, I must confess. But uh, again, I do not disagree with the people who wish to be vegetarians as long as it's their own choice. I've got no problem with that. Um, but I do appreciate a little bit of meat on occasions. Oddly enough, just uh, for the record, um, lately I have not been eating very much meat at all. I've, my body's been telling me to eat more and more vegetables. But um, somehow I feel every two or three days I must actually eat some meat. Otherwise, I don't know. It's just some, it feels like something's gone wrong. Okay, another key point, religious. Um, I get worried about using the word religious sometimes. Uh, religious, if you look it up in the dictionary, one of the definitions is attentive to fine points of detail. I'm sure that rather than being religious, we should be focusing on faith or awareness of God. But that's just my own little feelings kicking in here. Okay, here is to me a big one. Animal and nature loving. A person who loves animals and appreciates nature has reached one of the high points of humanity. Because what is around you in the natural state is one of the ways you become aware of God. <laughs> it's just so beautiful. Next, uh, just by the way, it switched over to the other side of the, the second column on the screen. Because there are so many of these traits, I had to use two columns on the slide. He is intelligent. And once again, that is such a key Factor. Remember the thing that uh, he was able to take the instruction manual from the lifeboat and to put it into practice. He had the intellect to say, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this. Let's see what else is here. Will this help me to stay alive? Yes, 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 yes. He did it properly because he's got good brain power. Okay? He's practical. And funnily enough, um, exceptional intelligence and practicality does not always go hand in hand. I mean, I look at something like, uh, I don't know if, how many of you watch The Big Bang Theory. And of course, you've got uh, Sheldon, who's massively intelligent, you know, IQ 200 or whatever, Sheldon Cooper, and yet is one of the world's least practical people. Can't get a darn thing right. Can't interact normally um, with the people around him. You know, only with his own closed circle of academic and um, uh, engineering friends. But simply impractical in most aspects of life. And Pi, on the other hand, is not. He is both intelligent and practical. So makes a simple plan, comes up with a simple solution and implements it. Determined. I mean, one of the things um, that continually keeps him going is he stops and he thinks, no, I'm not going to die. I'm going to stay alive. And he tries something else. How many of you watching have ever seen The Martian? If you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend that you see it. It's a similar type of story. It's a, um, just, I won't give you any spoilers, but it basically involves a guy stuck on Mars who has to make a plan to stay alive for a few years before he can be rescued. And it's so similar to this, where you are faced with an almost impossible situation, but you simply do your best to make it to the end. 
Another thing, sensitive, you know, um, a very good um, attribute to have because you can empathize with other people. You can feel their emotions um, coming through to you. Quick-witted means he's humorous. If you looked at the, um, the previous presentation, uh, we were looking at the way that he was continually making jokes at expense of Mr. Akimoto. <laughs> Okamoto. It was very funny. The sarcastic comments of his, <laughs> all of which were, were really poignant. They, they pricked <laughs> just a little bit, but they were definitely effective. And boy, he can come up with them quickly. Okay, funny, obviously. He's like me, he likes a good laugh. Well, I like not just a good laugh, I like many good laughs, especially when I get an essay to read, which is brilliant and witty and entertaining, and often I will roar with laughter. Wise, there is a difference between intelligence and wisdom. Um, wisdom is knowing how to apply your intelligence. Uh, Whereas, you know, intelligence is just uh, um, being able to interpret, etc. Okay, so there is definitely a difference there. Aware of beauty, yes. Um, this is something that I have and it means a lot to me. Uh, you know, they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I mean, oh man, um, I've, got to let, I've got to just share this with you. Often, when I drive to work in the mornings, especially in winter. I like to take the First Avenue route, uh, which goes out from um, uh, the circle at Prella Square, and then you go up and over this ridge, and at a certain point, you reach this top and you are looking down. You are above the highest buildings in Bloemfontein, and suddenly, in a fraction of a second, you've got the whole of the city spread below you, and especially if it's just at the moment of sunrise, or even just a little bit before sunrise, a little bit of mist on the city and stuff. It's not nature, but it's beauty in a completely different form. It's breathtaking, and you see for miles and the hills in the distance. I love it. It's something that uh, always makes me um, aware of just how magnificent life is. And finally, strong survival skills. Now, <laughs> that one is clearly evident by his nature during the, um, his time on the lifeboat. Commenting on that, um, strong survival skills means you've got to make a, a very nasty choice sometimes between doing uh, what your basic human instincts tell you not to do and going ahead and doing it anyway. It's not always easy. We're going to take a break. Enough about me rattling on about Pai Patel. Um, just a few minutes there. You've seen the various uh, um, attributes that he has, all of which are important in one way or another during the story. When we come back, we'll look at a few more of these chief characters. I hope that, you've in, that you're enjoying this so far. This was um, the sixth um, episode in our series on Life of Pi, and we were looking at characters in this one. Goodbye for now. I'll see you in a few minutes. Welcome back. We are looking here at the Life of Pi. This is the seventh in the um, series of episodes, I suppose you could call it. And we are looking at characters. The last character at whom we looked is, of course, the protagonist. That's uh, Pi himself, and now we are going to go on and look at other aspects of him. <laughs> Here we've got the adult Pi, and a few little pictures just to remind you of how he looks, etc., etc. Okay, and I'll leave you to feast your eyes on that vital information. Okay, you've all seen that. Let's move on. Mr. Santosh Patel. And who is Mr. Santosh Patel? 
He is the father of Bai. As easy as that. I quite like this guy, by the way. Um, he's not as uh, uh, gentle as Pai is, but he's intensely practical. I think Pai definitely got his practical streak from his father. Okay? He's the owner of the Pondicherry Zoo, as you can see. It says it there for you. But more than that, he's a very, very dedicated person at what he does. That's what I like about him. If I were an employer looking at his CV, I'd say this is the sort of person I would want to hire. Okay, and there we have this whole story about the political instability in India. We've looked at that already. I'm not going to repeat it now. And this guy obviously, well, is politically aware. I think I have included that. We'll come to that in a second. Okay, and that's, he disappears off down with the Tsum I don't think he ever made it out of the boat. But here are a few of his individual character traits. I almost said caricatures, by the way. That would have been totally out of context. But wouldn't it have just been the most beautiful malapropism? Right. He's cautious. That's one of the reasons why he very deliberately um, uses shock tactics on his two sons when he um, feeds the goat to the tigers. It's obviously a horrific sight, but it's the most effective lesson ever. This is interesting. To him, he's not anti-religion or anything. It's just not for him. I know quite a few people like that. I mean, the average person is not religious. Um, when you fill in, if I were to fill in a, a questionnaire, uh, now I'm going to live in a, um, a commune for a while. And then one of the questions they're going to ask is religion. And I would put on there Christian, okay? But so would many other people, even though they're not actually practicing believers. They're born into Christian culture rather than Christian religion. Like, you know the... Um, the, standard, the standard person will celebrate uh, Christmas and Easter and that sort of thing. And, um, well, that's what they regard as uh, part of their religion. Um, and they will therefore claim um, to be Christian, and in their, in their way, they are. But many people um, eventually wind up being dissatisfied about merely being born into a faith. Now, for the record, Pai himself is born into the Hindu faith. And um, when his um, auntie actually uh, uh, speaks to him and convinces him to become a, a practicing Hindu, he does. Now, that's um, quite, I wouldn't say unusual, but that's got a... Um, unusual parallel to my own circumstances, born into a, um, uh, what would you call it, a formal um, Christian household, and with, you know, attending um, traditional churches, etc., etc., but then for myself deciding that I'm going to become a, um, a fundamentalist Christian. In other words, take the faith seriously and go fully scriptural and study the Bible to make sure that what I'm doing is correct. And that's the, the path that I've chosen. So to a very great extent, once again, I can identify with Pi. But here, anyway, we're talking about his father, simply not religious, not really important to him. Politically aware, yes. Um, I'm politically totally neutral, by the way, uh, because of my uh, faith in God. Um, I believe that what happens, happens. I'm, I've got nothing to do with it. Um, if God is in control, why should I worry about it? So um, that's my feelings on the subject. Okay, but for Mr. Patel, he does not like when the politicians take chances with the country and subject them to rules and regulations which are not justified in his opinion. 
and so he leaves the country. He's modern, most certainly. He keeps everything up to date in the zoo besides anything else. And firm. He doesn't accept arguments. He runs his family very uh, closely and he knows exactly in which direction it is that he wants them to go. So, of course, when he, when he decides, when he makes that decision, we are going to Canada, nobody even dares to question his decision. That's that. They're going to Canada. He's firm as far as that is concerned. Let us now move on to Pai's mother. And there she is. You can see the picture. And surprise, surprise, there you've got the, the cat has been let out of the bag. Okay, in the first story, uh, the long one, she goes down with the ship. In the second, killed by the cook. And here we take a look at her personality traits. Okay, a book lover. She reads, and that's obviously something that she's given to Pi once again, the fact that he reads that survival instruction manual in the lifeboat. Another essential element of his makeup, he has to be a book lover, otherwise he wouldn't have survived. He takes the book and he reads it. Very calm. Not always logical, but always calm. Even in the lifeboat, in the second story, she remains calm. <laughs> Even when her husband is raging on about the evils of the political system in India at the time, she remains calm. Very loving, very maternal. During the incident with the goat, um, she's not pleased about what's happened. She points out, no, you've probably scarred these poor kids for life. And of course the husband, uh, because she's, she's the loving type, the husband's more the practical type. No, he says, he's given them a warning for life. <laughs> and now they're not going to do anything silly, like sticking their hands into the tiger's cage. Okay, she's gentle. Very um, obviously a person um, for whom uh, humanity is high on her list of respect. She wants to treat everybody in the best possible way. And she has courage. Um, even when her husband says something, she's not shy to speak out against him. I mean, once again, we're going back to the, the incident of the goat. Yes, um, she knows her husband doesn't uh, like contradiction, but it doesn't stop her doing it. And in that particular case, even though she's you know, within her rights to speak out, um, it still takes a little bit of courage to rise up and speak like that. And if you look at her behavior in the second story, uh, the human story, um, it's very courageous indeed, where she faces and gets killed by a person just because she believes it's the right thing to do, dying for her beliefs. I like her. I think she's great. And if I didn't already have a mother, I'd have said, hmm, I'd have liked one like her. <laughs> Ravi. We don't know much about Ravi. Um, he's very much just a person who's also there in the story. Um, he's he's likable, very likable, in fact. This is this will be the uh, uh, the popular guy, the jock at school, the one that the girls like, everything like that. I mean, just look at his face and his smile. I mean, you know, <laughs> average female looks at that and says, "Hey." He's cute. Anyway, there we have it. He's the older brother. Um, and here we have very briefly his personality traits. We don't really get much about him, um, but he's the typical uh, guy at school, automatically popular, extrovert, mixes easily with other people, in other words, playful and a tease likes to rip off Pi in a gentle way. <laughs> but when Pi's descriptions of him saying, mm, you know, you're next in the tiger cage, 
Uh, oh dear, that's a really awful thing to do. <laughs> and then, of course, um, he goes down with the symptom. Um, interesting to note, Pi tries to wake him up. But he's so deeply asleep that um, we don't know if he fails to wake up or just mumbles something in his sleep or something like that. But at that stage, Pi is getting worried and he's heading up to deck because he doesn't like being inside this boat anymore. And, of course, that's it. Ravi goes down. I mean, I've been, just for the record, in states of sleep like that where I've been so exhausted, we are so desperate for sleep, that even though I was aware of what was going on around me, my body was totally immobile. It wouldn't let me move for anything. So, yeah, I do feel sorry for the guy, though. It would be much, much better. The story would have been happier if he was on the boat with Pi, because then we'd have had more of this amusing interaction. But that's not how things worked out. Moving on. Got Auntie Roini. Now, please note the... Um, the mark on the, the forehead there. I don't know exactly what that means, but I do know that it's a, a, a symbol of devoutness, where the people are taking their religion seriously. Okay, so the sister of Pai's mother, right? And she has that impression important role to play in the story, she is the one that got him, Pai, to take his faith seriously. And that's what it's all about. Um, as far as the story is concerned, being religious or having faith is important. She had that role to play. Otherwise, she didn't appear that much or doesn't appear that much. And this is a most amusing feature of the story. The fact that there are two Mr. Satish Kumars. And the first one <coughs> is, of course, the science teacher. Biology teacher, to be more accurate there. A very important role, again, in preparing Pai for his time on that lifeboat. And here are his unique personality traits. Let's take a look. Atheist. <laughs> In direct contrast to Pi. So, he's also, now this one, a polio survivor. I've seen quite a few people um, who wind up in wheelchairs, you know, serious accidents, uh, lose the, um, the use of their whole body sometimes, and two different things can happen. They can become bitter and say that, you know, if there were a God, he wouldn't have done this to me. Or the other thing is they can, um, they will then become very, very seriously spiritually aware and say something like, I could, could have died. I'm going to be grateful for the fact that I'm still alive. And Mr. Kumar took the, the atheist position about the polio. He said, no, um, you know, obviously there's no God because he allows suffering like this in the world. All right. I disagree with that, but once again, we make our own choices in life. Scientific. Right. For him, science is the way to go. For him, science explains everything. For Pi, of course, science and religion hand in hand, no problem at all. Okay. And to me, the, the same is true to a very great extent. Now, communist. No, I'm not a communist. <laughs> um, strangely enough, um, the communists that I know and have known, um, I respect very highly because they truly believed uh, the teachings of Karl Marx, but I don't. <laughs> Even though I look like the guy, I don't believe his teachings. I think he went awfully off track. But again, that's my opinion. I'm allowed to believe what I want in this regard. And Karl Marx, of course, was, um, he described religion as the opiate of the masses. In other words, a drug um, to keep people subservient. And no, I disagree. But 
That's me. And this is one that nobody else has got in the story, and that is the triangle-shaped body or triangular-shaped body. I, I think it uh, would be better. But uh, be that as it may, it's not a particularly attractive body. And that's as a direct result of the polio, obviously. Okay, so that is the first of the Mr. Satish Kumars. Now, the other one is in complete contrast to the first. Here we have uh, the fact that he's a Muslim and a baker, right? So he's involved in a very much more simple uh, career. But the other thing is he is a very serious Muslim. And just by the way, baking as a career, I would love to do it. I absolutely crave the smell of fresh baked bread every time I walk past a decent bakery. And I mean, I buy most of my bread at um, a, a supermarket with their own bakery section, uh, very close to where we're staying. And wow, it's the best in bloom. But the one problem with it is, um, only on rare occasions do you get that lovely smell of the fresh baking. And that's when they bring out these racks with all the loaves and the, um, the savory breads and everything. And they bring these out. And it's only for a few minutes. We don't actually get the smell of the bakery. Even though the bakery is in that building, we don't get the smell of the bakery wafting through like that. And oh man, that's something I miss. And I really enjoy baking breads myself, and I have come up with my own recipes for bread. And okay, I'll tell you a secret. One of my uh, ingredients are revealed for the first time in public. I like to chuck Morvite into a bread that is made with um, whole wheat flour. And then I knead this loaf for at least 30 minutes in order to make sure that that gluten is thoroughly worked through so that when the bread rises, it will rise perfectly and form this crusty, delicious loaf. And the flavors are unbelievable. And I chuck in some, normally some sunflower seeds, um, obviously peeled sunflower seeds and raisins. And, um, you know, the, the whole thing is just a perfectly balanced meal. And I like to tear chunks of the loaf and eat it with the bread in one hand and a piece of cheese in the other, and it is paradise. So if I'd ever got into baking for a living, I think I would have been quite good at it. Okay, a Sufi, in other words, you know, deeply into the, the details and the significance and how to do it correctly. Okay, and the mystic uh, going far into the spiritual aspects, everything like that. And of course, here's how he fits into the story. He is the one who introduced Pi to Islam. And Pi, of course, ever curious, that's another character trait, I should have put that into the list, is Pi's intense curiosity, insatiable curiosity. He wants to find out about everything. It's his continual quest for knowledge. He's inquisitive about almost anything that you can consider. He wants to know more which is why he finds it so easy um, to go into multiple uh, religious beliefs simultaneously. There, we've had a good session. We haven't finished yet. So we're going to just take a short break here. A reminder, this was the seventh episode of the series on the life of Pi. And we are currently looking at characters and character traits. We'll be back in a few minutes, and I hope you're going to join us again in the very near future. Goodbye for now. Welcome back. We are about to do the eighth in our series on the novel The Life of Pi, and we continue to look at the characters. And we ended off the previous episode with Mr. Satish Kumar II. 
a reminder that there are two Satish Kumars in the story. This is one of the reasons why I am convinced that this story is 90%, 99% true. is because of these little details, the ridiculousness of having two people with exactly the same first name and last name all, interact, all interacting with the same person, and yet it's so credible because it shouldn't be true, but it is. Anyway, Babu is a character who basically just appears silently in the story, and um, he works at the Pondicherry Zoo. Okay, he's sort of like an assistant. Uh, we don't hear much about him, but it is important to know that he is a part of the story. Uh, just to comment on that, uh, examiners love testing knowledge of a story as well. And it is important because your knowledge of your story will form your um, level one and two questions because it's straight recall of information. And those are the little points that are going to boost your marks in exams because if you have that knowledge, uh, remember that 40% of the paper is actually level one questions, or sorry, level one and two questions, in other words, lower order questions. So you must have that knowledge. So with enough knowledge, um, you're just about guaranteed a good pass. And with excellent knowledge, you are just about guaranteed a distinction. So know your little details like that, the, the people who don't appear so often. Now we come to the pandit, uh, pronounced pundit. I don't know why, it just is. And of course, this is the Hindu uh, religious leader of the area. Okay, and obviously he's the one who leads the, the services that Pai attends, right? We don't know very much about him, except that he doesn't want Pai practicing three religions. He's very strict about the religious conventions of the Hindu faith. And he he's obviously worried that Pai is going to be um, polluted in his sight, polluted by fiddling around with other beliefs. Okay, so of course, remember your, the Hindus uh, worship in the temples and, um, well, we're about to see the various other people involved in Pai's religious guidance. Let's take a look. Here we've got the Imam, and basically that's it. As we all know, the Muslims worship in mosques, and they have a particular way of doing that. They, have, they use the prayer mat. It's in the, the novel, um, and uh, as far as I know, they face towards Mecca and all that sort of thing. And so here we have the Imam who guides Pi according to the principles of Islam. And now we have Father Martin. <laughs> you, as you can see, he's in proper robes and uh, religious uh, gear, so to speak. Um, and he's in a formal, um, what we would call an orthodox church, as the priest of this orthodox church. And he's also a nice guy. He introduces Pi to Christianity, unsurprisingly. And, um, oh, and there's a typo. Look there. I've left out the I. <laughs> Sorry about that. And this is why I like this guy also. Kind and deeply religious. This, um, I'm very careful not to enter into religious arguments with many of the people I know. Um, I've got a background from the Anglican Church. I was brought up as an Anglican. And I know some wonderful, wonderful, sincere people who are Anglicans. Even though I disagree with some of the doctrine, I still give them great respect. I have no doubt that they are sincere and dedicated believers. Um, so I don't question them on the uh, doctrinal differences. And I get the, the impression that this guy is one of these 
sort of people with whom I'd interact very happily, even though we disagree on certain stuff. It's like uh, my Seventh-day Adventist friends. Same story. Wonderful people. I don't agree with um, uh, their particular interpretation of certain scriptures, but I certainly can't question their sincerity. Now, here we have <coughs> the people in Canada. They're sort of like there. They're there only to really uh, reflect certain aspects of Pi's character, and then they're gone. Right? So we see Auntie G. Once again, a reminder that when you add that G afterwards, it's a sign of respect. And there we are. <laughs> What's very interesting in the book, um, as we get into the, uh, the third part, and he says, after all the hardships that he's experienced, he experiences nothing but fabulous behavior from all the people with whom he interacts, from the policemen who took him to the hospital, to the nurses and the other people who treated him in hospital, to the immigration and gov other government officials who helped him to go from um, Mexico to Canada without any problems. So um, there, she's merely there. He gets to Canada and she's the person who looks after him, but she never gets more than a mention. Okay. Oh, there we are. Term of endearment, right? We looked at that earlier in the same way as san in Japanese, term of respect. And now we have Mina, of course, Pai's wife. And again, she's there, she's in the story, but she's just there. <laughs> we don't know much about her except that she's a pharmacist and um, she also immigrated from... Uh, India, so um, obviously the two of them would have had much in common, all right, and we assume she's also working in Toronto. Nikhil, or Nikki, uh, Pai's teenage son. Again, we don't know. Not, not any specific information given. Um, they don't really feature, they don't make any, have any effect on the story. And then, of course, Usha. And I loved that picture um, in the movie of her holding her ginger cat because my personal cat is a ginger one who looks just like that. And he is fabulously affectionate. And so um, when I look at her cat and when I look at my cat, Mau Mau, um, I see exactly the same so I know exactly why she's so happy with that cat. Okay, and that's that of the Canadian characters. Let's move on a little bit to the animals. And here we have Richard Parker, and we've got to go into some detail here because it's important. Nobody except, or no animal except a a tiger would have made it through this. Um, the others, I mean, like the hyena and stuff, would not have survived. The zebra definitely wouldn't have survived because the zebna is a um, herbivore and he couldn't have been kept alive no matter what. Same with the orangutan, herbiv herbivores mainly, omnivorous actually, but needs lots of things like vitamin C and there was a terrible shortage of that on the boat. But tigers can survive. Let's take a look at Richard Parker. Please note the capital letters, Royal Bengal Tiger. And if you look in the story, <laughs> original name, Thirsty, longing for water, because he was uh, uh, captured as, well, rescued, I suppose, as a cub, and then, of course, taken to the zoo. And... Um, Let's see if I've put the detail down. Yes, yes, I put that down. Um, a clerical mix-up. And what happens? He winds up with the name of the hunter. Uh, whereas the 
Hunter, the hunter is recorded as thirsty and under surname uh, not known. <laughs> I thought that's a brilliant, humorous touch. <laughs> so the, the, the names of the tiger and the hunter get transposed. This is just the sort of thing that happens in real life, especially in bureaucracies. Okay, so, Pious Companion, we know that already. Now, this comment is from me. And it is vital because this is another thing that makes the story so credible. Tigers swim. For those of you that haven't seen Bangladesh, it is a country of water. It is the end of the, uh, uh, what's it, the Brahmaputra and the, I can't remember the other river, but two rivers combine together to form this wet, wet, wet river delta. And Bangladesh is among the most fertile areas in the world because it's got a lot of water and it's got heat. A lot of heat. And just by the way, the language of Bengal, Bengali, is beautiful. It sounds like somebody singing when they speak it. Um, there's, there's, <laughs> there's many languages which sound good, but Bangladeshi has got a music to it that I've never heard in another one. Um, honestly, it's fabulous. But the whole thing about this is, because it's lush, it's fertile, there's dense jungle, dense vegetation, with a lot of people living in it, the tiger has to be, the Bengal tiger has to be a swimmer because he's in an area where there's a massive amount of water. And of course, dense jungle cover and everything like that. So, and the fact that this is the biggest of the cat um, family makes it a very scary thing indeed because tigers can hide away in the jungle a few feet away from you and you don't know they're there. It must be a very a startling experience to encounter such an animal and uh, <laughs> still stay alive. But uh, as we said earlier, there are a few other species of cats, such as the jaguar of South America, who are also swimmers, who can go into water. I've actually seen, I was watching a recent uh, um, National Geographic thing on a jaguar hunting a small, what looked to me like an alligator or a caiman or whatever it is, but it was a, a crocodile type animal, quite a small one. Jaguar jumped into the river, grabbed this thing and dragged it back onto the bank so they too go into water. But for the tiger, it's the most important, especially in the um, uh, context of the story. Let's move on. Now we have the hyena. Oh man, why are hyenas always the bad guys? Again, we go to Lion King. Hyenas, I hate hyenas. I don't hate hyenas. Um, I know for a fact they can make very good pets because some people in the countries up north where the, um, the wildlife is much more prolific, um, you can take a hyena cub or whatever you call it and raise it, and it makes a fairly good pet. So, no, they're not all bad. In the same way that some people find bear cubs and raise them as pets. And other people, um, this I have seen, uh, take a roikat kitten. Now, this is something special. Listen to this. You take a roikat kitten, um, obviously uh, it's separated from the mother cat at no more than about the age of three, maybe four weeks. And you put that kitten in with a normal domestic cat in among her litter. She will suckle it, and that roikat will grow up into a full-size roikat, yes, but it will think it's a domestic cat. It won't realize that it came out of the wild. Same thing with hyenas. They are not horrible bad things. And very unfair that in these books... Uh, in these stories, uh, you know, uh, Lion King and Life of Pi and stuff, it's always the hyena that's the bad guy. Really. But anyway, they are very dangerous predators. 
and um, hyenas very often um, will make the kill that the lions will then steal from them. They do go for kills. So they, um, they are not cowardly scavengers only. They are also quite efficient hunters. But they've got the most incredibly powerful jaws. They can literally crush up bones. No problem. And um, swallow and eat them. Okay. Now in this uh, story, yes, um, he wipes out both the zebra and the orangutan. But of course, hyena, who's the size of a large dog, versus a Bengal tiger, who's the size of a medium to large horse, there's not much contest. The tiger's going to win. You know, if it was a if it were a pack of hyenas versus a tiger, yes, the hyenas got a a, a very good chance because they can encircle and come in from all sides. Um, although the tiger is obviously just going to run away; he's not going to stay to fight. But <laughs> By himself, one on one, no chance. Orange juice, the orangutan. And I must say, sorry, I'm just going to go back. Take a look at that face looking at you. It says evil in a bad way because it's laughing at you as it's planning to go for your throat. The artist who did that, I don't know who the artist is, but the artist who did that really captured the ugliness and the evilness of the... Um, hyena, and then of course you've got orange juice, the orangutan, and that's a very soft, gentle face. Don't believe it, by the way. Orangutans are very powerful creatures who can hurt you very badly, uh, in the same way that baboons can really injure you. Uh, if you ever encounter baboons in the wild, they can be very dangerous indeed, and they've got very potent teeth and jaws. Okay, basically killed by the hyena. Now there you get a, um, a, a description of a human-like traits. All right, lonely, seasick, brave. And the zebra. <laughs> Beautiful creatures, zebras. This is Grant's zebra. If you go down to the, um, uh, the Mountain Zebra National Park uh, near to Craddock, there you'll see the mountain zebras who were almost extinct at one time and now they've bred back to the point where they are no longer almost extinct. Quite a different pattern from the Grant Zebra, but nevertheless, zebras. Okay, there we are. Um, all the traits that you want in an animal. Um, there we are. I won't read them to you. I'm sure you can read it perfectly well for yourselves. And... Um, being dropped into the lifeboat, right, eaten by hyena. That's what we know about that. Now, the blind Frenchman. <laughs> Bear with me, we almost finished with character traits. This picture I got straight off um, uh, Google. I found the worst possible, e most evil looking person wearing glasses, shades like that, and I've used him. Um, the blind Frenchman wasn't, as far as we know, wearing a hood. We don't know for sure. But uh, anyway, that person to me says, hmm, definitely evil. Okay. Comes across this one uh, is when the, the blind guy and Pi meet up in the ocean. We looked at that during the plot section. Okay. And Fre the Frenchman tries to uh, kill him because he wants to eat him. Forgot about the fact or never knew about the fact that there was this rather large Bengal tiger who was also hungry at the time. And the tiger got him. Okay, there we are. Not a sort of person you want to have as a friend. Can't trust him. Don't want him around. What's it? Mad, bad, and dangerous to know was once a description of Lord Byron. And this one is worse than Lord Byron. Now, very briefly, we've got these ones, the human story, and the, the second one, French cook. There we are. I've included the word there, psychopathic. Psychopathic means has no conscience. Will do anything immoral and simply does not see anything wrong with it. Does whatever he wants. And that is why psychopaths uh, very often wind up in prison. 
Okay, obviously he, he's the hyena. Then we get, we're back to Gita Patel. Um, there we are. There's the information about her in the second story. And she is orange juice. Chinese sailor. Okay. And then we have Pi Parker, also known as Richard Patel. No, that's not a mistake. I transposed them on purpose. It's like um, Gildenkrantz and Rosenstone in Hamlet. They're the same person, essentially. Here we have, um, you'll notice even the, the drawings have mixed together the various animals in the second story to make them human. Here we've got this time the tiger wearing the turban. Okay. You see that? The, the one becomes the other and the other becomes one. And it is no question about killing. Just do it. It's necessary. It's done. Finally, these Japanese officials, <laughs> our comedy elements introduced. Mr. Okamoto, there you see it. Right, he's nature. You can read it for yourself. I'm not going to read it to you. And that is a very detailed and good summary of who Mr. Okamoto is. We have Mr. Chiba, the assistant. And what is his nature? He's a newcomer to all this and very soft, very um, sympathetic towards Pi, and far more keen to accept the first story. And there's not much more to be said about our characters. When we come back later, we're going to look at uh, various other aspects that need to be covered when we're studying the story. We're going to look at certain things such as themes, although there are very few main themes here, although lots of themes, but very few of them. But there we are. We have come to the end of the eighth presentation in the series, and we were looking at characters, and we've looked at the whole list, including um, the ones during the second story. I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope that you found it useful. And I hope that you'll join us again soon as we look at the final part of Life of Pi.